that I could send it out. And so I would sit and type and put things in a folder. And that's where I did a lot of my notes. Smart. Right. And no I one's going to hack your typewriter. <laughs> yeah. And it's, a, and it's um, you know, I, I, I kind of like the banging and the noise of okay. it. Sorry to interrupt again. Okay. We are going to get ready to start in a few seconds. Around 6.03, Ed will let people in. Great. I, I, am... will, um, I will start with, uh, let's see. It is 6.03 on my computer. I am going to let everyone in. Okay, perfect. And then I will wait just a couple of minutes before I start my, or a couple of seconds before I start my uh, introduction. All right, here we go. One, two, three. Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's event. My name is Grace, and I'm the event producer at University Bookstore, the largest independent bookstore in the region. Thank you for joining us for a discussion of author Heather Lundy's latest book of Bears and Ballots. Following the 2016 election, Heather was one of thousands of women inspired to take a more active role in politics. This book follows her time as an assemblywoman in the small town of Haines, Alaska, and how she dealt with everything from a bitter debate about the expansion of the fishing boat harbor, to the matter of how to stop bears from rifling through garbage on Main Street, to the recall election campaign that targeted three assembly members, including her. Heather has contributed to essays and commentary to NPR, the New York Times and National Geographic Traveler, among other newspapers and magazines, and as a former contributing editor at Women's Day. A columnist for the Alaska Dispatch News, she's also the recipient of the Susan Nightingale McKay Best Columnist Award from the Alaska Press Club. Her previous best-selling books are Find the Good, Take Good Care of the Garden and the Dogs, and If You Lived Here, I'd Know Your Name. Heather was voted Citizen of the Year, Haynes Chamber of Commerce in 2004. She'll be in conversation today with Ross Reynolds. Ross is executive producer for community engagement for KUOW. You can purchase copies of Bears and Ballots on the University Bookstore website, and Heather has even sent us signed book plates, so you'll be able to get a signed copy. If you have any questions, please type them in your chat field anytime, and Ross will be able to ask them throughout the conversation. And now I will turn the screen over to Heather and Ross. Enjoy the event. Good evening, and thanks for joining us. And Heather, a great pleasure to speak to you. How late uh, is the sun out there in Haines, Alaska this time of year? Oh, late. I mean, I think it's setting around 10, 30, 11 at night, but it doesn't really set. It's not like, you know, in Mexico where it just gets dark. We get a long nautical twilight, and then it's back up again at about three. So long, long days, 18, 19 hour daylight. It's well, great. I I want to talk about the bears. I want to talk about the ballots. I want to talk about politics. But first of all, I just want to talk about Haines so people can get some flavor of the place you come from. You wrote, it's not a city. It's a remote rural borough the size of a small state, mostly wild and roadless. How do people make a living in Haines? Good question. <laughs> they, they like to joke that, you know, we're like the, the, the underwear, no visible means of support. Um, there's uh, fishing. We have a fishing fleet, a uh, small fishing fleet, gill netters that catch salmon primarily, but halibut and crab and shrimp. Um, they're busy right now. We have a tourist economy. Uh, the cruise ships come here. We're not a major port. Our dock can hold one ship at a time, can come to Haines, but we're right in between Juneau and Skagway. Um, all of our businesses are locally owned. Like my family, my husband has a, a lumber yard and a hardware store, and uh, the grocery stores are owned by families. Um, the uh, in general, so there's a merchant class, and then there's government. You know, the Haines Borough employs a lot of people. The state of Alaska employs people. The federal government, to some extent, in Alaska has there's some employees. The post office, that kind of thing, and then we have. Um, Something unique, I think, to Haines is that we, we, we have a, a big portion of our population that uh, doesn't rely on the local economy for their income, whether they're retired or whether they're, you know, uh, distance working, they do their job here, but it's for a company somewhere else. There's a, a fair amount of people that do that. But we're not, by any stretch, we're not a wealthy town. Uh, 
Yeah. A lot of small towns lose their younger residents. Young people just want to leave small towns in many places in the, in the country. How about Haynes? I think um, it just depends. You know, I think there's always going to be the country mouse, city mouse. You know, if you're from Haynes, you want to go to someplace bigger. There's also the fact that if you, you know, go off to college and, and have a profession that you might not be able to practice in Haynes, say you're an architect or an attorney, we don't have either really of those here, this might not be your spot. On the other hand, I have um, five children and two of my daughters live in Haynes now as adults and have uh, I have five grandchildren here and two more of my daughters are in Juneau, which is about 90 miles away. And my son, who fished commercially for many years, is now living in Western Australia where it's warm <laughs> and he surfs out there. So, um, you know, my family has all stayed nearby and um, my daughter, one of my daughters is married to her high school sweetheart and um, his family is all in Haines as well. You didn't grow up in Haines, right? No, I grew up uh, in New York on Long Island, and I met my husband at Middlebury College in Vermont, and um, we got married uh, right after, pretty much I graduated, a year after I graduated in 1982. He studied forestry and wanted to go where big trees were. So we bought a pickup truck, drove to Alaska, caught the ferry, you know, in Prince Rupert at that time, and came up, and we've been in Alaska ever since. So my whole adult life, really, I just turned 61 uh, last week. And I've been here I mean, since I've been 22. Haynes is um, far away from a lot of places. It's like a, a three hour boat ride to get to Juneau, the next city. Yeah, like so, closer to five. <laughs> five. And so you don't end up in Haynes by accident. Uh, like, do, do many people come to Haynes? And why would they come to Haynes? Why do they come to Haynes? They come to Haynes, I think, because it's beautiful. I mean, for starters, it is just beautiful. It's like Switzerland with the beach. You know, it's the, it's the, the, up at the top of the inside passage. So the mountains are really high and they're, you know, studded with glaciers. From where my house is, it's only eight miles as the crow flies over into Glacier Bay. So we're, we're right up in the corner of uh, Canada and Alaska where it's just really, really beautiful. And um, it's a, you know, there's abundant natural resources, fish and wildlife, and um, people fall in love with it, especially when they come in the summer. Winter can be a, a little more of a challenge, but it's a nice life. Uh, Heather's book is about Haynes, Alaska. It's of bears and ballots, as you can see there beside her. And it's about politics in a small town. But I also just wanted to talk, I mean, lots of go water's gone out of the bridge since you wrote this book, uh, yeah. COVID-19, for example. I'm really curious about how this has hit a small town like Haynes. Do you have many cases there, for example? Uh, we've had, I believe, a total of five. Um, three have been in seafood industry workers that are actually at a remote cannery that isn't connected to the road system to Haynes. It's kind of around the corner. And I think, from my understanding, is they were just asymptomatic. They were tested but didn't get sick. And likewise, there were two other cases that were caught in um, routine testing for either people coming into the state of Alaska, which you have to do when you're returning for work or home or whatever. Um, and both of those cases, the person, the people didn't get sick either. So we haven't actually had much. And the town itself has, um, you know, we're very strict in the beginning. Uh, but then it's, it's kind of loosened up uh, considerably in some ways, almost too loose. And then we had our first case and everybody got alarmed. And so then we went back to more strict. You see masks, um, hand washing, Businesses are, there's a, one bar I think that's open. There's a coffee shop that's open. Our bookstore, you can walk in with a mask with like one person at a time. Our lumber yard is an essential service, but masks are required. And for a long time, only, you know, parking lot service. That so sounds, people are careful. That sounds a lot like Seattle in many ways. And, and yeah. has it affected the economy a great deal? Or, are, are people struggling without jobs? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think um, because of the no tourists is the huge one, you know, so our summer just didn't ever happen the way it usually does. And and people are, you know, carefully watching the fishing season, you know, what, what will happen with the, with the markets. We're very fortunate that we have a local salmon processor here in a cannery that has a, a good market into the Yukon, into White into Whitehorse, and they're still able to sell fish there. So our local guys, some of them fish for that cannery and that that may be a really good thing. Um, 
and uh, you know, it's just it's just slower and quieter. And there are people that are definitely hurting. Um, you know, the Salvation Army is up in terms of food. A lot of the economy here are people who are artists or kind of um, subsistence people. So they're not really eligible for any of the benefits because they don't really have um, jobs that fit those uh, sort of classic descriptions of things or work in anything but odd jobs are on their own. And I wonder if you could explain people who are, live subsistence lives, because I don't think a lot of people understand what that is. My understanding of it is they're basically able to live off the land. They really don't yeah, need to be they, in the cash economy. Right. And they're not, you know, they're bartering, they're, they're catching salmon. We can catch, you know, pretty much as much as you need in the net and put it up for the winter, freeze it or can it, halibut. People have gardens, you know, you might go moose hunting, deer hunting. Uh, that kind of thing. So you, you know, there's stuff in the freezer. It's difficult to be completely subsistence, but a lot of people really supplement their livelihood, and especially artists. We have a lot of artists and sort of alternative types that do that. And, um, you know, their, their income might come from waitressing in the summer, driving a tour bus, leading raft trips, the, you know, guiding people uh, on, a, on a trail, and they're not able to do that right now. So there's, there's pressure for sure. And the third major convulsion has been, of course, uh, the demonstrations over racial justice, which have taken place all over the country. And as you're well aware, uh, very big here in Seattle. I wonder if that has touched Haynes at all. And I know there's a part of your book that kind of might be good for you to read, but uh, have have you seen any Black Lives Matter demonstrations where you are? We haven't had demonstrations. It was interesting. What we had here was we had a a memorial a candlelight memorial, even though it was daylight and the wind was blowing, so there wasn't really candles, but we tried, um, for um, uh, George Floyd. And it was put on uh, by two women in town who wanted to, you know, just felt terrible and wanted to do something. And it was our, really our first community gathering after all the sheltering in place. And it was outside on the parade grounds that um, ironically is at uh, Fort William H. Seward which um, now there's discussions that I have a little bit um, in the book, maybe I'll read to you because the issues in, in Haines anyway, are um, more related to native Alaskans. Yes. And, yes. and at, the, at the memorial service, um, a, a native Alaskan a young man spoke very eloquently about um, feeling very connected to Black Lives Matter and the, the movement and also to, you know, what, what was happening as a native man and that, that they are standing very closely beside um, uh, their, their black brothers and sisters in the, in the lower 48 more. Haynes has a very small um, uh, black population, but a, a, a significant native American one. And this is um, actually, it, it was, it was interesting that it's in the book, but um, this is a little bit I'll read to you from when um, my friend, and the uh, Alaska Writer Laureate at the moment is Ernestine Hayes, who's a, a Native American woman who's a terrific writer. She's um, written uh, The Tao of Raven and um, Blonde Indian, which um, the title is a reference to the fact that she was fair as a child and some people referred to her as um, a blonde Indian. And um, she got stuck at my house during a snowstorm Again, the transportation issues are hard. And we ended up having this discussion that uh, is really um, very current at the moment. And um, I said the the change in plans was frustrating for Ernestine, but it ended up giving us time for the kind of dicey, important conversations we would not normally have had about race, privilege, history, education, the difference between growing up native and poor as she had and white and well off as I had, to name a few of the subjects we touched on. At the time, Haynes and Juno were planning celebrations of the sesquicentennial anniversary of the Alaska Purchase by highlighting our connections to former Secretary of State William H. Seward. Ernestine asked, does anyone really believe Russia owned Alaskans and that they could transfer us and it to the United States. She said it always irked her that Klondike stampeders were required to carry a thousand pounds of survival gear and supplies, enough to live for a year in the wilds of the North Country, or they'd surely perish. 
the Yukon and Alaska was not the moon. There were people living there and they had food and they had shelter, they had families, Ernestine said. This territory was their home. All that changed when gold was discovered and Alaska has never been the same since. The non-native town site that began with Mrs. Haynes' mission, our town is named for a, a, a missionary who never visited here, um, to convert the Clinket people filled rapidly with outsiders after gold was discovered in the Porcupine Mining District. Then came the salmon canneries and the army and all the people who make modern Haynes, the dreamers and the builders, the lost souls and the entrepreneurs, the teachers and merchants, the preachers and pilgrims, native and newcomer. While I pondered the most appropriate way for Haynes to acknowledge the Alaska purchase, I made more tea and put another log in the stove. Ernestine told me of the time she had spoken to a group of volunteers at a woman's shelter about her perspective as a native woman who had suffered abuse and had ended up trying very hard not to argue with the white social worker who insisted that she never notices color or race and that everyone looks the same to her, which Ernestine thought was absurd. I shared with her how my one brown-skinned daughter, I have a daughter, Stoli, who was adopted, had recently been told by a friend of hers that she was white inside and that it was meant as a compliment. What was that person thinking? Ernestine asked. So that's a, a little bit of a discussion. And, yes. a, and a lot of the book is kind of like that. I think the stories come from my life and family and community and relationships and um, and politics, of course, is part of that. And she's Heather Lendy. As you can see, the book is of bears and ballots and Alaskan adventure in small town politics. I'm just curious, uh, how's your brown skinned daughter treated in Haines? Does she face uh, difficulties? Uh, no, she's treated she's treated very well here. And um, uh, the, I know she grew up here, and I think. Um, um, she, she she doesn't, but I think she's starting to realize sometimes, I think now, um, especially with the news of the world and going other places, she's, she's feeling a little bit worried. Um, she has three children. Her husband is a native um, Alaskan. Um, but I think part of that, I mean, to be honest, I think part of it is because she's my daughter and her, her brother and sisters are white and the our family is, you know, privileged. And so I think, you know, there's, there's that. She's, um, Stoli, uh, her real name is Stoyanka, that's her nickname, but she um, is uh, Bulgarian and Roma. She's uh, from, from that um, part of the world. And there are actually several um, uh, Roma children in Haines with different families through a <laughs> doctor here that, um, visited over there and worked in an, an adoption agent in an orphanage and then ended up encouraging people in Haines to um, take in some of these children. Um, Heather, uh, your book is about politics. It's about you running for office in Haines. You were well known there. You've written several books about it. You've written obituaries about the people there. You've been a radio host. You're well known. You had a prominent role in the community. Whatever prompted you to jump into the divisive field of politics back in 2016? You know, I thought the whole country was becoming politicized. I thought, you know, I'm, I'm a grown up now. I don't have as much to lose. I was really excited about the prospect of our first woman president, which we all know how that went. And I just thought, oh, naively, this is going to be great. I can do this. Winters are long. I would like to spend some you know, I don't, I don't want to just be at home in the dark. I'll go to these meetings. And I was on the planning commission. I tried that. So I was on it for three years. And that, I thought, you know, gave me a real insight into governing. Um, and then I also decided that I would just, when I ran for office, I would just be who I was because I wasn't trying to be a professional politician or anything. So I would just answer the questions about environmental issues or, you know, what I thought we should fund more than other things and just be honest. And then if people voted for me, I figured, well, then, then they agreed with me and that would make it easier to serve. Um, it turns out that that didn't necessarily <laughs> happen. <laughs> well, um, I, I gather you would be considered a liberal in the context of Haines, Alaska, but I wonder if you could sketch for us 
sort of the political lay of the land there. Yeah, the political lay of the land in Haines, on the plus side, and this is really cool about this town, is that we are very politically active. People pay attention to local politics. Everybody can tell you who's on the borough assembly, what the issues are. People are well aware of our political structure and, and, and are involved. So that's really good. Um, the other thing about the community uh, is that we are, uh, traditionally, we've been sort of 50-50 on everything. So you can always please about half of the town. We're tipping a little bit towards um, uh, maybe a little more progressive, if that's the right word. I was, I was just looking up because I, I had the book that in, um, uh, in 2016, um, voters here favored Hillary Clinton for president but um, Republican incumbents for Alaskan offices. So Republicans for that. So purple, purple one place. of the, you know, so we're, we're back and forth. You know, we've always voted for Lisa Murkowski here, um, but, um, and, and there was one little precinct where in the, up at Mosquito Lake where they voted for Trump, um, but there was only 96 votes up there and about half went for him a little more. But so we're, we're, we're mixed here um, and uh, people feel very strongly, especially on the extremes, the far rightish and the far leftists are very, very active. And the issues usually fall under um, environmental development type issues are, are the big divides here. And leading up to 2016, how would you characterize the way that people in Haines could discuss politics? Uh, could, was there uh, civility? Was it lots of screaming and yelling going on? Both, you know, I think, yeah. I think looking back on it, there's been screaming and yelling going on for years. And after I got in, I heard all these horror stories from other people who were having like post-traumatic stress from being on it. But I think it got worse with the national, my, my theory is anyway, that part of the, um, the, you know, the national leadership and having that kind of vitriol um, always being on display on the news and the, the shouting uh, and the way, um, uh, politicians and leaders were speaking to each other. It, it sort of gave permission for people to do that in a smaller town, uh, particularly on social media. Uh, and that was weird when you can practically open a window and talk to everybody to have that kind of thing going on as if we wouldn't notice what somebody said on Facebook. Yeah, how did people get their information in Haines? I mentioned a lot of them came to meetings, so they got it firsthand, but the radio well, and social media, apparently also a way that people got news. Got yeah, we're, news. we're really fortunate here that we have, a, we have a weekly newspaper that we've had for years and years. And I actually, I profiled the, the guy who started the paper was a, um, Ray Menneker was a, uh, uh, he was Jewish. He graduated from Columbia, came to Haines in 1955, a Navy veteran um, who had gotten a teaching certificate in California and brought a wife and I think one or two young children and taught French and started a journalism class at the high school that became our local paper that's still wow. in existence. And Ray also founded uh, the local public radio station and uh, the environmental organization. And, and he was on the borough assembly for seven terms, which is like 24 years and was a self-described socialist. So, you know, and that was when Haynes was a logging town in those days. Um, so anyway, um, the newspaper still exists and it's a very independent, uh, paper and then the public radio station has two reporters that cover <laughs> all the meetings and school board and everything that's happening in town. So there's that. But then there, what happened was there was a closed Facebook page that many of the people who were the uh, critics of the assembly or um, in charge of what eventually became a recall election didn't speak to traditional media. They wouldn't talk to the newspaper, no comment, no comment to the radio, and they operated everything on a closed Facebook page that they- So just, interesting, they basically created their own media that yeah. they would trust and they obviously didn't trust the other outlets. Yeah, yeah. So their and own- that, And that happened and that's similar to what's happening in the, in the country, yeah. I think, to a certain extent. So uh, did you come into office with some signature issues, some things that you wanted to see happen in Haynes and, and how did that unfold when, if you came yeah, in with I these think, goals? You know, the, the big one was that uh, there was two of us, myself and the editor of the Chilkat Valley News also was elected at the same time. And we, we 
data field of candidates that were uh, very conservative. And one of them was even an incumbent that was the deputy mayor. And our issue really was a new harbor uh, design. It was 30, some $30 million harbor project. And um, the design involved uh, a huge parking lot and a big steel wall that um, residents found very controversial. It wasn't that we didn't want the harbor expanded, but we had this picture postcard harbor and now it was gonna look kind of, and look bad and also not be very effective. It wouldn't add new slips, you know, kind of technical things about the harbor. But anyway, we ran on the idea that we should have a referendum before we start construction on this thing, let's vote on the design. And um, so when we won and, and that was very controversial, and so we thought, well, people do want us to vote on this. And then at our first meeting, we tried to bring that up and got slammed. And then it was, well, let's have a special meeting to decide if we can have a special election. And it became a big scene and it failed. The motion failed to do it. It was a, a tie and the mayor broke the tie. And so the sitting assembly members, one of them joined us, but the other ones didn't and um, it didn't happen. And so again, it's sort of similar like what happened in the country. So they won, there was no referendum, but then the next morning we're gonna recall you. You know, that's mm -hmm. it. You didn't, and that was that was really literally like the first meeting and it was over because we didn't get to have a vote on the harbor and it became like we were arch enemy number one. So how long into your term was the recall called for? About nine months. The, okay. um, the, the uh, well, it was started pretty much right after the harbor boat, the threats came and then it, it filtered slowly through until they, it ended up, you know, basically being in every meeting, you know, there's always something that someone disagree with. So then they run and get that person to sign the recall petition against you. And, and it was just, they strung it out as long as they could. And so by April, they'd filed the papers and the, and the election was in August. Did that uh, political animosity turn into personal animosity? Were you shunned or do people attack you on yeah. the street? Not physically, but maybe physically. I don't know what happened. It did for me. I mean, I don't know. I, I just, it felt like it because I, I had had such a long relationship with people here. So it did feel very personal and, and it was hard, um, especially when the recall petitions came out. And, um, and I felt bad because I don't think the people who signed this realized it because of the way the petition was being passed around, but um, everybody's name was on it and it was public and it was posted you know, on the, on the borough website. And I, I think people were just appalled that their name was there and that I could read it. And, you know, and we all could, because I think the person who had been circulating was like, look, it's just an election. Just sign it because you want to vote. It's not, it doesn't mean you're saying anything bad about them. And no one will know that it's you. And in fact, it's saying that we, you know, accusing us of misconduct in office. It's pretty serious. And, and your name is on it. And um, that was kind of a shock to see people that were <laughs> friends of mine, or I thought were people, not friends, but just people that I thought I'd had relationships with, you know, that- did, did, were, were, there were, there, were there conversations about that? Were, did, you, did you ask them why they signed it? Or did, did they, they come thought, to you and say, oh, I, I didn't? I, I did when I, when I first, one of them was there, I was like, oh my gosh, this is the woman that I play golf with. And I'm, golf in hands, it's, it's a loose term. Our golf course is kind of a lynx and you play with rubber boots and can bring your dog, you know, and, and my softball team learned how to play golf when we got the golf course. So I've known these women for years and we're not very, well, Jenny got, she got pretty good at it, but I'm still not very good at it, but it's fun to go out there. And um, I was like, how, I called her right up and I said, you've signed this? And she said, well, you, you took the mayor's um, salary away when she was in the hospital uh, with her mother in Seattle. I said, no, we didn't. Where did you hear that? You know, well, yes, you did. I said, no, no. I said, we, we actually, it turned out our mayor's salary had been higher than any place in the, in the region. And our mayor is a, a, a figurehead in a way. The manager runs the borough. So it had been $15,000 and everywhere else it's an it's a honorarium of, about 7,000 or less to nothing in towns our size. And so we just, for the next year's budget, because everybody was looking at reducing the budget, we said, well, let's, let's get the, that back in line. But we didn't take the current salary. It was for the next person who ran for mayor. Yeah, so did that it, misinformation cycle within this private Facebook group? Yes, and then and when I found that when I, I confronted people, it just got worse. They got mad and upset. 
and at you. So then I just stopped. Yeah, and so then I was like, ah, I just, I guess I won't say anything. But there was another one that was circulating that was we were going to charge everybody a hundred dollars for a water meter and then start charging for water. I mean, we never even discussed water meters. Where'd you hear that? Yes, you did. I know you did. <laughs> <laughs> like so you kind of just gave up but i mean you're still in office and you're still advocating these ideas uh, mm -hmm. did you not want to try to figure out a way to convince people or let people know that they they had misinformation um no you know we tried i think there was there were forums there were there were ways to do it but basically the the best defense seemed to be a good offense that just keep running government and some so like some of my very favorite parts of the book are in between all this turmoil, emotional turmoil and community disruptions are all the little um, uh, manager and committee reports of what's still trying happening. to run the run the place. Yeah, and, and it is happening. You know, it's like, um, oh, I don't know, where's one that it's just there. They're all of these things like in the middle of you know, the terrible recall and you're crying and all this, you know, awful stuff is happening. It's like, the harbor staff reports that after beaching the Letnikov Cove Harbor float, they discovered some damage, but it should be repairable. The Public Safety Commission meeting on the drug abuse issues was well attended, informative and directive. Attendees recognized that enforcement is not a solution, though generally supported greater financial support for the police department. The finance department reports that tax statements are at the printers and should be distributed next week. Public Works has reconsidered the recommendation to dike the Kahini River to protect the Porcupine Road. And that do you want to pursue the option of maintaining the Sunshine Mountain Road as an alternative route? And the construction of the wastewater treatment plant is ahead of schedule. You know, and I put those in so people would realize that what government does mm -hmm. and also that it still happened. Like we, we weren't in a way that Washington often is or sometimes even state governments where we can't pass budgets or we're at a complete deadlock over politics so that things don't happen. We still approved, you know, a union collective bargaining agreement for employees. We still passed a budget. We funded the library. We funded the snow plows. Government went on and we were able to do all these things while this was all swirling around. People don't really understand a lot of what government does, do they? No, and so that was why it was neat to put it there. I mean, people who don't like government really want to make sure when they turn their water on that it comes out clean or that their toilets flush or that their roads are maintained or even, you know, the library is open or the preschool or the senior center or all these things that we depend on all the time or the park is clean. Um, you know, the trash is emptied, that kind of thing. The outhouses are cleaned. These are, that's all your government is doing that. So you're elected and you and Hillary are going to do it, but that doesn't happen. <laughs> um, you, you push on this issue with the harbor. You feel strongly about it. This provokes a lot of controversy and a recall vote is called for. What happened to the recall? Um, well, you might just have to read the book to find out. No, well, obviously I'm still sitting here. So um, I think that... Well, I don't think execution is part of recall. <laughs> no, and it's not, that, that's also not the main... Um, page turner part of the book, I suppose. It's all the relationships that happen in it. But what happened was it was uh, defeated. Um, all three of us who were recalled, it was myself, the newspaper editor, and an artist, a local artist, because they figured they'd get all three of the more liberal folks. And um, it was defeated 60-40, even right across. It wasn't like someone said, well, I liked her, but I don't like him, or I liked him, and I didn't like him. That it was pretty much the same. The town decisively, decisively defeated. Yeah. Uh, is that a, what, is that a wider margin than well the other? I guess the it was, election. Yeah, it was, I got more votes the second time than the first time. Interesting. So that must <laughs> have been more actually. That, that must have been affirming. <laughs> yeah, I think it it, it was because, um, but it was still heartbreaking that it even had to happen. But it, it was affirming, and I think then after that, it was time then to we still had two more years. You know, I was like, oh my gosh. I'm like, I, what have I gotten myself into? And now I got to keep going and put that behind you and try to move forward on the assembly. Did you, did that make you want to kind of um, roll back some of the things that you might have wanted to move on because you realized what a turmoil that they would cause? Uh, we were more careful, but then there was more because we, we had to hire a new manager and that became a, uh, an issue and another, um, but, but we did it and we hired, I thought, 
a, a really good manager and uh, a local woman and 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 that worked out well we hired a new clerk that worked out well there were people meantime that were quitting there was assembly people that quit there were staff people that quit and we managed to get everything kind of back up and running sort of smoothly but there was still um an undercurrent of um you know f fighting back all the time and that's hard it's it's hard to run a community when when there's when everybody's always kind of yelling is that always going on there heather and you didn't really realize it until you were in the eye of the storm maybe because my my husband <laughs> warned me because he had been on the old uh we changed, we unified governments, it used to be a city and a borough, like a city and a county. And then we just made it just one because it seems silly to have two mayors and two assemblies and the whole thing. So we did one and my husband was on the old city council for 15 years and then the unified government for a couple of years. And he's very calm and even and steady. And he, he left when he said, you know, I, I he, he decided to become the treasurer of the arts council instead because you know nobody buys a ticket to something they don't want to go to and they don't sit in the front row and complain when they get there and um he warned me but i i didn't listen i think i thought especially because i'd been on the planning commission and that was a group that we tried to solve problems a lot you know people come with a zoning issue it's just simpler because it's just sort of one thing and it often isn't political to try to figure out, you know, where the driveway is going to go on the side road or how to work out a boundary dispute with a neighbor or if you can have a conditional use permit. It, it's the process was so, seemed to be kind of clear. Yeah. Where I hope, governing isn't as clear. I hope your husband had the good sense not to say, I told you so. He never did. He never did. And he promised he never would. So you obviously knew a lot about Haynes. You knew a lot of people there. I think one of your books refers to the fact that if you know everybody's name in Haynes. So what did you learn about Haynes and these people around you that you didn't know before you became an elected official and began to work in politics? I, I think I, I saw the town very much, um, you know, through rose colored glasses, I think. And I've been accused of that <laughs> many times by people who said, ah, Haynes is like crazy. And how can you, and I, I think I, 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 you know, I realized that it, it, it wasn't all that I had thought it was. And there are other parts of the book where we, I talk about that. There's some, there's some difficult things that are revealed to the whole community that we, we didn't realize. Um, and um, writing about that and wondering how, um, you know, like, like Rumi talked about the truth, you know, being a broken mirror where we all see a piece of it, you know, and I think that's true of any place. It's true of families. It's true of communities. It's true of um, countries, states. You know, we, we're seeing that now. I think some of that fracturing of where, you know, who do we trust? What happens? I thought this was how it was, but it isn't how it is. And, and things are being revealed that, yeah, they were there all the time. And I just didn't realize my complicity in it, which is, I think, very similar to what's happening in the country with social injustice and racism, the environment, um, even the virus, you know, we're, we're like, everybody's off balance. And we're wondering, is it politics? Or is it health professionals? What's happening here? And I, I came to the conclusion that there's still a lot of really good people doing a lot of really good things. They're honest, they're kind, mostly, but there's some not so good ones. And, you know, you, you have to know that they're there. And they're all constituents. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think so <laughs> sometimes. But I think there's also the other thing I did learn, too, that there's, you know, one way to sort of put um, especially well-meaning uh, people who get involved in government, you know, to, to put them off balance is to say, you know, you're not listening to me and you're not being reasonable and, you know, you're not hearing everybody, you're just going with your own agenda, but this is what we want. And, um, and again, I think we're seeing that now there's, there's a time for leaders too, for people to stand up and say, you know, I hear what you're saying, but that's not the right thing to do just because there might be a lot of you in the room that say you want to pollute the river. I don't think that's anything that I'm going to vote for. And even if the majority of people said to do it, I'm not going to do it. And, you know, and I, and those are our issues, but they're, they're really true 
we're seeing it with, um, you know, the racism and systemic issues, you know, just because it's always been this way doesn't mean it's okay. Yeah. Uh, by the way, we have our chat function at the bottom of the screen here. If you've got a question for Heather, and in fact, we do have some questions. Elizabeth asks, has publishing the book made any of your relationships harder? Has there been pushback? No, I, so far, no. I mean, I'm kind of waiting. The, the bookstore in Haynes um, has sold about 300 copies of the book. And how big is Haynes? Well, there's 800 households. So I figure people are sharing it too. That's good penetration. So I think, I think people are reading it. Um, are you going to do a public reading where you might get um, some? Well, what we did, what was interesting, what we did do, because we're practicing all this Zoom stuff, and Haynes is a very small place and trying to figure this out. So it was a local arts group got together and they're going to they're gonna do the, the book launch, you know, and um, to practice, they had... Um, we did a, a Zoom event with the editor, the new editor of the Chilcat Valley News, uh, Kyle Clayton, and I did a kind of a local one where he just asked a lot of questions about the, you know, sort of insider questions, I guess, about being on the assembly, about Haynes, about the whole, about the characters that were involved that, um, and a lot of people came and saw it. And I, uh, including uh, some of the people who were the, um, you know, ringleaders of the uh, recall. And I haven't heard bad things from them because I, the only thing I have heard is that maybe I was too nice to <laughs> the, the people who were tough on me. But I think that, that bothers me too, because I think, I think that's what we have to do right now. That the only way we're gonna heal what is ailing, not just communities like Haynes, but our whole country is that we, we have to find ways to relate to people. And we can't just say, you know, okay, you weren't nice to me, so bam, I'm not gonna be nice to you, and you did this, and bam. And I, I don't mean to say that we don't deal with the really hard things, but we have to try to find places where we can have some common ground to have a conversation at least about it. Well, that's democracy, right? But, but it, when you're working from different, when you're in different worlds and you assume something and you strongly believe in it, and even when you're told that it's not true, you still believe it, uh, how, do, how do those sides even get together? They're not dealing with the same version of reality, yeah. particularly if they won't listen to someone telling them something. But I'm kind of curious about how, if we talked a little bit about relationships and things and how has this changed you to have gone through this experience? Oh, it changed me a lot, I think. I was very upset for a while, almost grieving, like like physical grief. You know, I write, I've written some 400 obituaries for a lot of these people and their families that I was involved with. And, and it felt like that to me. It felt just, you know, visceral. Um, but then uh, after I survived the recall and then after I stayed in office and I got to work as weird as it might sound, I mean, I've, I'm a grandmother, but I, I um, gained a lot of courage and I gained a lot of confidence that I wouldn't have had I not had to. <laughs> you know, if I hadn't been in that situation, I would never have known that that was how I was gonna respond. And I worked really hard at trying to be civil and listening and not I'm not a fighter by nature, um, but I also didn't want to just be a doormat either. And so I just learned, you know, I could just raise my hand and vote. I could say what needed to be said and that was it. I didn't have to, I didn't have to lash out at somebody. I didn't have to get angry. I could just do what I needed to do as an assembly person and as a human being. And um, so for me, it was, was pretty good. I mean, by the time I left the assembly, I was actually, I thought I was doing a pretty good job. I was pretty good at it. I could run a meeting if I had to, a committee meeting with people being very upset. And I wouldn't have been able to do that in the beginning. My hands would have been shaking and it would get all red. Um, I, I am in awe of facilitators who can do that. I can remember watching a meeting when it was going completely sideways and a woman kind of took over and was just able to calm the room. And I just, how did, what was your technique? Because people get pretty crazy meetings, as you point out in the book, someone once told you, no one comes to a meeting in order yeah. to tell you how good things are. They're there because they've got an issue and they want to tell you about it and they want it heard and they ideally want you to change. 
it was just to say, you know, it was a committee meeting. We're here to gather information on this ordinance that had to do with water, you know, with restrictions for what you could do along the riverbanks. It was miners that were upset. It was a very hot issue. But we were just trying to gather information about how to word the ordinance. And so I just kept it to that. Like instead of, I didn't argue when someone said, well, we don't think, okay, so you, yes, you know, so-and-so owns a fuel company. You want to make sure we can do this. Okay. Write down, thank you. You want to do this, thank you. You know, one at a time. No, we've already heard from you three times. Now it's you. Like, use your authority to still listen, keep it, but don't, um, I think as a chair in the meeting, don't argue with each person. Sure. You know, don't, don't say what your opinion is. Just gather it. Let them speak their piece. Give everybody a turn. And then that, that tones the whole, then people aren't getting angry. You know, it tones the whole thing down. Um, so, and just um, recognizing that you're, you know, you're the one in the front of the room. And so you can do that. Uh, so I, you know, and I still, I love it here. I also learned, I think the other thing I did learn too was, um, you know, that campaigning and governing are very different things. Um, and, uh, you know, campaigning, you want the Harbor referendum. Well, then when that doesn't happen, and, and then when you get into officer and say, you can't do that now at this point, we're too far along in the project, it'll ruin everything, it'll be, and it's like, well, then why was I allowed to campaign on that? I mean, people voted for me, like, what do you mean? And I think that happens a lot. People get in and then they're told, no, no, that was last year's issue. We're already down the line here. You're not going to get to do that. And then they keep fighting with whoever was there. So um, that's a, that's something I learned. And then I also learned that, um, you know, nobody ever was elected who said, I will change my mind or I will compromise. And you have to, and not on the big stuff, not on the, not on the things that are like your core values, but you know, you might have to give a little on how wide the buffer is on a sidewalk in front of the Harbor or, you know, how much you really want to spend painting the public safety building or the color of it or something that you, you know, okay, they didn't like your choice. So get it done and let that one go. Well, you survived the recall, but you didn't run for re-election, right? No. Was that an easy decision? Yes. <laughs> um, and I, I think I, I learned, it was interesting, I learned from one of the, um, the managers who was very helpful to me when I, when she first got hired and it was right after all the recall and she sat me down. I've known her for years because she lives in Haines and she, she sat me down and she said, Heather, you've got five children, right? You know what's best for them. You had to make decisions when they were in high school. They couldn't go out all night or they couldn't buy the basketball shoes they wanted or whatever. And, and she said, and you still love them. She goes, you don't even like some of these people. You don't have to please them all. Use your mother brain. You're using your, your writer brain and your writer brain is like, oh, but this is such a great I like their story and I know what they're coming from. And, you know, they're really upset, not really because of the assembly, but I happen to know, you know, that they lost a son or, you know, whatever. I, there was other things happening and I could see what was erupting. And I had this empathy for their story. And that- But the mother brain. <laughs> the mother brain said, I love you anyway, but no, lights out, we're all going to bed now. <laughs> and so, so, you know, that, that helped me. And I, and that's where I think that the book might help other people running for office, not to necessarily be like me, but to really recognize when you went in, what are the tools that you can bring to it? What types of characteristics and um, uh, just ways of being that you, you can help your community and, and how you would deal with some of these things and think about it ahead of time. You know, time's almost up, but we didn't talk about the bears yet. <laughs> there was a bear issue in Haynes. I guess that's not a surprise. What there was it? There's what lots still, of bear what, issues. What happened? Well, we have, a, we have an area um, where there's bear viewing for tourists that you just drive to, right, from the cruise ship dock. It runs along the, a little, about a mile stretch of the Chilkoot River and Chilkoot Lake. It's extremely scenic. There's bears fishing on it um, all the time, spawning for salmon. Uh, salmon are spawning and the bears are eating them. And, um, you know, of course, everybody wants to see a bear. So the vans come and the buses and locals, you know, grandma's here, let's drive her to see the bears tonight, you know, and everybody takes a picture. And 
it was getting um, too crowded and there was concerns. There was even people stopping traffic to let bears cross the street from the, the river up to the woods and that kind of thing. Um, and um, so we put a moratorium on new tour permits out there and then talked about maybe building bear viewing and an alternate route on the road. And that was a continuous, um, it was, it was, we discussed it a lot. Tour permits, especially to see wildlife were a big part of what we did as an assembly. And then there was also the issue of those bears have become habituated to people. So they would walk into town and then get into garbage or cherry trees or chicken coops. And, you know, then it's electric fences and bear proof dumpsters. And we want to live with bears because they're valuable, <laughs> but they're also, you know, it's pretty cool to live in a place where you have essentially grizzly bears, brown bears, the coastal brown bears or grizzlies, you know, in your town. And there's a lot of them and they're not endangered and they're beautiful, beautiful animals, but you don't want them on your porch. Heather, I've really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. The book is called of Bears and Ballots, an Alaskan Adventure in Small Town Politics and Heather Lindy is the author of it. Thanks very much for your time. And we have some cr closing remarks from Grace. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, and I'm afraid that's all the time we have today. Thank you to Ross and Heather tonight for the fascinating and informative presentation. And a very special thank you to you, our audience, for joining us tonight. For those, who are, those of you who joined in after the intro, you may purchase copies of Heather's new book, Affairs and Ballads, from University Bookstore. Heather even sent us some signed book plates, which we'll include with your purchase. Unfortunately, there seems to be a tech issue, of course, on our website right now. I just checked, but please check back tomorrow to purchase your signed copy, or you can call our store um, anytime between 9 and 5 for at 206-634-3400 to place an order. Thank you all again, and have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you, Grace. Thank you, Ross. I guess we're done. <laughs>